So, this morning, we are back in the book of Daniel, and I have titled this morning's message, Looking Up. There is an outline in the bulletin if you'd like to follow along, um, and all that jazz, in case I see something interesting that you want to take note of and write down. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, as I reminded you, we are in the book of Daniel, so please take your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 1 with me. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 21. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's Bibles in your pew, and as always, I will have all the Scripture up on the screen as we go along this morning. Now, before we look at today's passage, it's been a few weeks since we've been in Daniel, so we need to recap what's going on in the book of Daniel. So, when we talk about Daniel so far, the kingdom of Judah was conquered by Babylon, and Daniel and other young people were taken from Judah to Babylon uh, they were taken, uh, Daniel was taken with three of his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The four of them were grouped together, and they were t- taken to Babylon to be taught over the next three years, to be taught the Babylonian language, the Babylonian culture, the Babylonian literature, their religion, science, magic, astrology, all these things. And they were kind of given a life of luxury in a sense. They, they got to eat the same food that the king ate because they were supposed to be taught up and then put into the king's service. But Daniel had an issue with the food they were given. It was the same food given to the kings. But Daniel knew that these foods did not conform to the laws of Moses. Daniel decided he couldn't eat this food and he wanted to continue to honor God. So Daniel approaches the guard that's assigned to him and his friends, and he says, Can we do a 10-day trial, please? Feed us nothing but vegetables and water. And after 10 days, see how we look compared to everybody else. Because the guard was worried, if you guys start to look sickly, they're going to take my head off. So Daniel says, well, let's try for 10 days, and let's see what happens. So Daniel says, after the 10 days, you take a look at us and see how things are, and then you make the decision." That's where we left things off. So let's pick it up in a point in my message I call Looking Good. And we're going to look at verses 15 and 16. And it says this, At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and, and the wine and that they were given to drink and kept giving them vegetables. So after 10 days, they looked healthier than the others. It even says they looked fatter. They must have ate a lot of vegetables. I don't know how you can get fat on vegetables, but God can do anything, right? They were able to stay on their diet of just vegetables and just water. Now, we learn here right away that God blesses those who obey his commands, and he prospers those who trust him. So God's working here, right? Because here they are, all these other guys were eating all these choice foods and these meats and all that stuff. And God shows up and after 10 days, Daniel and his friends actually look more fit. And it says they even looked fatter than everybody else. So scripture clearly tells us that we should all be vegetarians. It's not true. But this is an awesome moment of God working, okay? But we're not done there, because when we talk about this, we say this was more than just a pretty face when you look at Daniel and his friends. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the very next verse. In verse 17, it says, As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. And Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. You see... These four were being prepared by Nebuchadnezzar for positions of responsibility in the royal court. But even more so, God was preparing them for what he had for them. It was God who gave them knowledge and God who gave them understanding. And then it says Daniel excelled even further than the others. He had mastered the art of oneromancy. It's a word we use every day, right? A neuromancy is the art of being able to understand dreams and visions. Now see, being able to do this was extremely valuable to the king, okay? Because in any kingdom, uh, the king would have dreams, and we all have dreams, and the king would always go to his, his advisors and say, I had this dream last night. 
I was wearing a dress and throwing pickles at people. What does that mean? No. He's, he said, I would have this dream. And he would ask his people, what does that mean? And they would say, oh, great king. And they would do all those things or whatever and say, this clearly means this. But somehow, somehow we know how, it was God. Daniel had the incredible knack of being able to know what these dreams meant. And as things played out, the king would go, oh, gosh, Daniel was right. Oh, this guy's pretty good. uh, Predicting the future was something that many kings would have sought and seemed valuable to them. You know, I mean, I had this dream, and it said, well, this means that you should go conquer this land over here, or whatever, you know, and if they lose, then the king says, where's that guy who told me to do that? (laughs) Take care of him, right? But a man who can interpret dreams and visions is a valuable man to the king. So we come to examination day. And look what it says, starting in verse 18. It says, Then, at the end of the days which the king had specified, For presenting them, which we know was three years, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. For every, as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, He found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus, the king. Now, these four were were found to be far superior than anyone else. In fact, it says that they were ten times better than any of the advisors the king currently had. You see, the king would use magicians and enchanters, astrologers, sorcerers, and others to advise him and tell, tell him what the future would be and what his dreams and visions meant. Daniel's abilities would have caused King Nebuchadnezzar to rely on him for understanding of future events. See, these guys were trying all this other mumbo-jumbo, and Daniel had the awesome power source. He had the power of God. It says here that Daniel served in the royal court until the Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the Persians and King Cyrus in 539 B.C., for those of you who are history geeks. This was over a 60-year period that Daniel served the king. Wow. Daniel was determined to honor God, even in a place where the people did not adhere to God's standards. Think about this for a second. Daniel was determined to honor God by the foods he ate in a place where people did not adhere to God's standards, they wouldn't have noticed if Daniel was observing God's law or not. And God honored Daniel's obedience, and he promoted him to the king's court. Isn't that a nice story? I feel like I just finished a children's Bible story. But what do we do with this? What do we learn from this? And I think that one of the important things that we need to understand, and this story in Daniel is not the only place in Scripture where we see this and we understand this, that the idea that there is blessing in obedience, okay? There is blessing in obedience. Look what it says in Leviticus 26. I want to read this to you. It's a little long, but listen to what it says. This is God speaking, and he says, If you keep my laws and are careful to obey my commands, I will send the seasonal rains. The land will then yield its crops and the trees will produce their fruit. Your threshing season will extend until the grape harvest. And your grape harvest will extend until it is time to plant grain again. You will eat your fill and live securely in your land. I will give you peace in the land and you will be able to sleep without fear. I will remove the wild animals from your land and protect you from your enemies. I will look favorably upon you. And multiply your people and fulfill my covenant with you. You will have such a surplus of crops that you will need to get rid of the leftovers from the previous year to make room for each new harvest. Did you catch the the prerequisite of all that? If you keep my laws and are careful to obey my commands, God says, I will bless you in all these ways. Now, I want you to think about this, and there's a couple ideas, I think I have four here, that I want to talk to you about obedience. And when we talk about obedience, obedience kind of has a negative 
feeling, oh, I gotta obey, I gotta be obedient. Now, as parents, we say about our kids, oh, they're a very obedient child and everything. And then kids are like, oh, I gotta obey, right? So we think obedience sometimes can be a, a negative thing, but it's really a positive thing. And I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about this idea that there is blessing in obedience. And there's a few ideas, and you can write these down in your notes. And the first idea is this. Obedience in small things can bring God's greatest blessings. You see, Daniel's decision not to eat the king's food would have seemed like a small matter to many around him. Like, oh, Daniel, what's the big deal with the food? You know, Often, God's greatest blessings come as a result of our willingness to do something that appears very small and simple at the time. Something as simple as changing the diet they ate. But then what do we see? God shows up and all of a sudden they look stronger and fatter and better and healthier than everybody else. Oftentimes, obedience in small things can bring great blessings from God. Because you never know how God's going to use them. But sometimes as Christians, we could say, yeah, it's not a big deal. It's just a little thing. I don't need to worry about doing that. We may dismiss things by saying, oh, well, that's too difficult, or I don't want to, <laughs> or, well, I just need to pray about it. That's the spiritual answer to, I don't want to. I'm not saying that. We do often say that, and I will say that I need to pray about things, and I do pray about them, but sometimes we'll use that as an excuse, too. The little things, obedient and little things, sometimes bring the God, God's greatest blessings. The second idea is this. Our obedience benefits others. Look at how Daniel's friends were blessed by Daniel's obedience. They went along with Daniel and ate the same food. And look what happens. Daniel and his three friends wind up serving in the king's court. And they were far better than everybody else. I wonder if at any point they wanted to say, Hey, Daniel, thanks for, thanks for the diet tip, buddy. I wonder if they ever did. But Daniel's friends were blessed. Through our obedience, others have the opportunity to witness the Lord's awesome power and authority. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about how our very lives are one of the most powerful witnessing tools we have for the glory of God. And as we are obedient, and as God works in our lives through our obedience, others are benefited as they see God working in us, whether it's big or small. But here's the other thing to remember, that God's call to obedience always demands a response for us. God calls us to be obedient. We have a choice, yes or no. But when we are obedient, others will see it. And God often rewards others, in particular, those closest to us as a result of our obedience. We see this very clearly with Daniel and his friends, don't we? But it makes sense, doesn't it? Think about your home. If you're living your life right and, and obedient to all that God has called you to be, it affects your whole family, doesn't it? Of course it does. It makes complete sense. Our obedience does benefit others. Here's another thing to remember. Obedience never brings disappointment. What do, we mean, what do I mean by that? We, like Daniel, must recognize that obeying God is always the wisest course of action. Let me say that again. Obeying God is always the wisest course of action. God could take any situation, no matter how hopeless it seems to us, and change it into something splendid, even magnificent. I know there's times that we may hesitate to obey God because we may fear the consequences of our decision in light of the world. But the Lord's command is for us to fear Him above all else. Because remember this, the same sovereign, omnipotent God who keeps our hearts beating and the planets orbiting is more than able to handle the results of our obedience. Is God all that or isn't he? He is all that. He calls us to be obedient not because he just wants to see if he can get us to jump through hoops. There's a purpose behind his obedience and we'll talk about that more in a second. Remember that we are instruments of God's glory and God is glorified through our obedience. When he tells us to do something, and we know without a doubt that it is his will, then we need to obey based solely on who is telling us to do it. When we choose to obey God, he will bless us. And this is because obedience always leads to blessing. We have all had times when we do not understand why God is asking us to do a certain thing. 
But if we step out in faith and we obey him, he will reward us with a sense of peace and joy that compares to nothing that the world has to offer. It's kind of an awesome thing at times when we say, well, I just need to do what God is telling me to do. There's no pressure in your decision making, is there? Because immediately you're going, okay, God's got this. But here's the other thing to remember, and this is the fourth idea. Our obedience protects us. Through our obedience, we are spared the consequences of many things which God's, God desires for us to avoid. One might say that part of God's discipline is inherent in the natural consequences of disobedience. I was talking with a friend this week and I said, imagine if the entire world lived according to God's word and was obedient to who God calls us to be. Imagine what that would be like. And the response was, well, that would be heaven. Yeah, I guess it would be, wouldn't it? Obedience to God protects us. When we look at the Old Testament, and we talked about in the book of Daniel, even here, where they wouldn't eat certain foods because the laws of Moses said you shouldn't eat these foods. Well, you say, okay, well, why is that? Did God want Israel to jump through hoops? No. We know today that the foods that God told them not to eat are foods that required special preparation that they would have got sick if they would have eaten them. God was protecting them through obedience. This is a very important thing for us to understand. So often I hear people in the world say, well, where is God when this tragedy happens and that tragedy happens? And my response is, God gives us a set of rules to live by. He gives us a way to live our lives, and we thumb our nose at God, and we do our own thing, and everything goes haywire, and then we blame God. I said this once before. It's like putting oatmeal in your toaster, isn't it? You buy a toaster, and a toaster's for toasting toast. And you put oatmeal in it, and you try to cook oatmeal. And what happens? It fries your toaster, and then you want to get mad at the company who made the toaster, because the toaster doesn't work right. The life that we are called to live, to be obedient to God and to honor God, is not for punishment. It is not for, like I said, to get us to jump through hoops or whatever. It's for our protection. There is blessing in obedience. Part of God's blessing is inherent in the avoidance of consequences that happen as we obey God. Are you with me? Does that make sense? There is so much blessing within obedience. Now, does that mean that when we're obedient, our lives will be perfect? No. Sorry. Sorry to burst the bubble there. Because some of you may have been sitting there saying, that's all I got to do. I just got to be obedient. And everything's going to be perfect. No, but there are many blessings within obedience. And they're blessings that you may never expect. Blessings that you may never see. You see, God works in ways that he wants to work to be glorified through us. Not in ways that we want him to work. Where we think the best way God can be glorified through us. You know, I think God would be glorified pretty good through me if I was a millionaire. Pretty sure that's not God's plan for me, though. As we are obedient to God, as we do the things that God calls us to do, as we be God's people, and as we are the church that God calls us to be, God, we will see blessings from God that we never could have possibly imagined. But in order to do that, we must be willing to say, okay, God, I think this is the best course of action, but I'm going to trust you because you're God and I'm not. You know everything and I don't. You can do anything and I can't. If we simply remember that and recognize that, and we surrender to God, and we allow Him to work, we will see God do amazing things in our lives, in our church, in our homes, in our families, and in our witness for His glory. Amen? Lord, may we understand what it means to surrender. Well, may we understand what it means to be obedient. And to find your blessing in obedience. And to see you work through our lives. May our lives be a testimony to you. May our lives be a testimony to your kingdom. 
May others see us and you be glorified through us. So as we leave this place today, we do so in the strong name of Jesus Christ, empowered by your Holy Spirit, declaring your truth to everyone we meet. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day.